Now it gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Heiner Bielefeld, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief and has held this important uh, position since 2010. Heiner is a philosopher, a historian, a theologian, and is based in Germany. He teaches human rights and human rights policy at the University of Erlangen, Nuremberg, and was appointed to the OSC ODEA Panel of Experts on Freedom of Religion or Belief uh, this year for a three-year term. <coughs> Professor Bielefeld, thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, everybody. Security is an elementary state function. The state has to provide security in the service of those living in its jurisdiction. But security should not only be in the service of people, but security policy also should be carried out in respect for everyone's human dignity. I mean, human dignity lies at the heart of human rights. And you can see that in the very first sentence of the preamble of the first ever international human rights document, the Universal Declaration on human, of Human Rights 1948. It starts with, and I quote, recognition, this is the first word, recognition of the inherent dignity of all members of the human family. This, it further says, provides the foundation of justice and peace. So it's the foundation of justice, of peace, of security, and I would even go a step further. I mean, this respect for human dignity, this really is the source of any normativity whatsoever among human beings, among individuals, among groups, among nations. Respect for human dignity. That's the source of all. Now, can we provide security without that respect? Maybe yes. Maybe yes. But security politics without respect for human dignity would come close to the mafia type of security where the guy on top creates a climate of intimidation to suppress all possible rivals, all possible opponents, I mean, and that climate of intimidation also breeds mistrust. And mistrust certainly is not the suitable ground, not a fertile ground for developing sustainable security. So a security politics based on rule of law, maybe it's a more sustainable one, based on rule of law, on principles of transparency, of accountability to the people, and again, at the core of all of this, respect for human dignity, respect for human rights. All the human rights are about securing human dignity and respect for freedom of religion or belief as one of the indispensable human rights. Now, let me emphasize one thing. Human rights are not a utopian dream. Human rights have been created for the real world. And that also includes FORP, freedom of religion or belief. It's for the real world. For a world stricken by conflicts, problems, and also serious security threats. So human rights will not only come later as a sort of dividend that we can enjoy once the dirty business of security politics has been successfully completed, but human dignity, human rights, freedom of religion or belief, I mean, they set the conditions for any rule of law-based security politics. So they are part of coping with the complicated world. So human rights are not utopian dreams, not at all. This also includes freedom of religion or belief. It's for the real world. And now, I mean, in, in our very complicated world, of course, sometimes 
we are confronted with conflicting interests. And then we, hear, we are very often hear a slogan, not only from governments, but also from other people saying, okay, freedom of religion cannot be absolute. Freedom of expression cannot be absolute. Freedom of assembly cannot be absolute. Nothing can be absolute. It's true. But it's dangerously true. It's a dangerous truism. Because if you, if you say that, I mean, you tend to trivialize freedom and then invite all sorts of limitations, maybe unlimited limitations. Yeah? Freedom is not absolute. Freedom of religion is not absolute. What does it mean? No, the point is, in order to preserve the substance of freedom of religion or belief, and the same applies to any other human right, we have to be very careful, very diligent, very precise when dealing with limitation clauses. Limitation clauses. And there's always one metaphor coming up in these discussions, a metaphor which always makes me very, very nervous. And this, I mean, you know it all, this metaphor is balancing. Be very careful. Balancing, I mean, it's, it sounds very relativistic. It has a certain, let's say, common sense element of truth, but it's very, very relativistic. So it, it, it sounds like, okay, we have different concerns on our weighing scales, and then, okay, there's freedom of religion, there's security. Okay, we have to weigh it up, we have to juggle with all these conflicting demands, and in the end, the weighing is left to governments. They can decide, they can decide as they see fit. They can also maybe arbitrarily, discriminatorily decide. There we have to be very, very careful. So I would actually encourage you to reconsider the balancing metaphor. I use it sometimes myself, but let's be very careful. Balancing is a wrong metaphor. It actually invites selling out the substance of freedom of religion or belief and any other human rights. So instead of the balancing metaphor, I would call for applying a justification logic when it comes to limitations. Justification instead of balancing. So have a look at Article 18 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, or, I mean, similar provisions concerning other rights to freedom. There you can find limitation clauses, and I don't want to go into technicalities now. Let, I would just like to draw your attention on one little word, one little word that carries all the weight, and one little word is so small that it sometimes tends to be overlooked. And this little word, word is only. Limitations can be justified only, only, if and yet another if, and yet another if. So a number of ifs, only if, only if there's a legal basis. So we cannot leave these important questions to the administration to be decided on the spot. We have to have a le legitimate purpose. So public order can be a legitimate purpose. Then proportionality, but again, proportionality should not be trivialized as balancing, because for instance, one component of proportionality is if you, if you go for a limitation, in order to justify that limitation, you have to prove also empirically that this limitation is really suitable to serve a certain purpose. So, I mean, when fighting, for instance, terrorism, acts of terrorism committed in the name of religion, okay, I mean, this is a challenge now that we confront in all states, also in the OSCE region. But where is the connection between restrictive, restrictive dress code stipulations and fighting terrorism? Yeah? And I mean, very often, this is an obvious example, very often if you really go to an empirical analysis, you will see that many of restric uh, the restrictive measures really mainly aim at showing off the government wanting to demonstrate we are doing something, something. And, but the question is, is that really suitable to a legitimate purpose, like security, public order. And there we often have questions. And if, I mean, the questions prevail, then that measure cannot be legitimate. So it's much stricter. Then also necessity. 
So the necessity criterion means always choose from the various options the least far-reaching intervention. So the mildest measure, the least restrictive one. Usually states have various options. And if you go for a more restrictive one without really trying the less restrictive one, this will not be legitimate. Yeah? So the justification logic means we stick to an understanding of freedom and limitations as a relationship between rule and exception. In reality, it's often the other way around. People have to apply for a special permission to conduct services, to educate children. No, I mean, the, the, the logic of human rights is exactly the other way around. Because respecting human freedom in the area of religion, but also in other areas, means you cherish the very source upon which all normative commitment in ba is based, respect for human dignity. So the starting point must be respecting human dignity, which is tantamount to respecting freedom, human freedom, the freedom of individuals, but also of communities. And only then limitation issues may enter the picture, but if deemed necessary, they carry all the burden of justification. So the justification must always fall, the burden of justification, on those who deem limitations necessary, not the other way around. And there's a lot of confusion in this area. There's a lot of confusion. And unless we are very precise in dealing, and first of all in understanding the limitation criteria, we are in danger of selling out the substance of human rights, of human dignity, of freedom of religion or belief. I mean, this is really the test case. Uh, understanding limitations to follow a justification logic. And if you take that seriously, it also means you will come across absolute norms. Because, I mean, the very logic of justification presupposes an addressee. I mean, those people who might be affected from certain stipulations, limitations, restrictions. It's vis-a-vis -vis those people that the justification business has to be carried out. And this means brainwashing. Never, ever, even under the most extreme circumstances, not even in a situation of emergency. Because brainwashing or torture, slavery, so infringements in the forum internum, in the moral nucleus of a person, I mean, destroys the very logic of communicative justification. So this can never be justified by whatever reasons might be invoked. It's above any possible justification. Okay, to conclude, uh, a careful handling of limitation clauses is really the test case for preserving the substance of human dignity, human rights, freedom of religion or belief, and other rights to freedom. So um, this is the test case. And uh, taking it seriously means go for a justification logic, not this easygoing metaphor of balancing, which is so misleading, so relativistic. Taking all this seriously is not a luxury in times of security threat. It's the precondition of developing sustainable coping strategies, because only then can we ensure a security that is in the interest of people, but also in respect of everyone's human dignity, which itself is, as also Joel pointed out, the precondition for developing trust. And trust is another keyword. A security politics based on rule of law is a trust-building exercise, and freedom of religion or belief is an indispensable component of that trust-building. Thank you very much.